fan club for Ole here. Uh, yeah, most of us, I think, know him very well, so he's not really an introduction, because he's one of us, or he used to be one of us. But he actually left us a couple of years ago, went to the University of Surrey, for good or for worse. Um, we were all very, very happy. Uh, but anyway, he, he's now there, and he, he's quite happy there, I guess, and he does a lot of work on morphology, syntax, typology, and language documentation and description, working on all sorts of interesting languages, in particular some African languages and some languages, uh, some Tibet urban languages, and that's what he's going to talk about today. It's a joint talk, actually, but his courses are not here, I guess. You will <laughs> no. Them, right? Yes, I will. Yes, and we'll introduce your topic. But basically, it's about uh, referential density and differential partner marking. Okay. Thank you very much, Irina. Um, thanks, everybody, for coming. Uh, it's really lovely to be back um, at SOAS. Uh, it always fills me with a nice warm glow to be here. Um, and then I leave and I go, thank God I'm not there anymore. <laughs> um, there is a handout, but as you can see from my very high, um, highly... Uh, high DPI pictures, uh, it's probably taking Candide ages to print it. So it will come, she's doing it now. And everything on the handout is the same as on the slide. Okay, so um, yes, when I worked here, I worked on African languages, but now I work in Nepal. And what I'm going to talk to you about today is, um, well, sort of, referential density and differential argument marking in three of the languages that I'm working on with my co-authors, Christine Hildebrandt, who many of you know, who's at SIUE, which is in Edwardsville in Illinois, and Dubi Nandadakal, who is our other co-author, uh, who's based in Trubavan University, which is in Kathmandu. Um, as you can imagine, Illinois and Kathmandu are quite far away, and as much as the draw card of SOAS is wonderful, they couldn't make it today. Okay. So this picture here is of Nar village, which is uh, where one of the languages that I'm going to talk about is spoken, and it's <coughs> only spoken in one village. And um, I thought it was a fitting picture because they live in quite a densely packed uh, village. Okay, so the main issue today is case. If you were interested in agreement, you're not going to get any, I'm afraid. Um, so... I'm going to talk about case and the relationship between case and differential argument marking and how that fits in when, in a language that has very low referential density. So just to recap then on what I mean by case, case is a grammatical strategy for assigning and identifying the role of MPs through morphological marking of its dependents, such as core arguments and adjuncts. And the thing about case is there are different ways of assigning it. Uh, both sort of in purely descriptive terms and in theoretical terms. So one way you might talk about it is that it's structurally predictable, okay, that, it occup that, it's, that you get a given case because you're in a particular structural position. That's the kind of thing that you might think about if you're, in, if you're a minimalist, for instance. Lexically predictable, that it's assigned based on a particular lexical item. So a particular verb says, I need my subject to be in dative case rather than, say, in nominative or rogative, which might be the norm, the normal structural case, for instance. Or it can be semantically determined, and this is what we're talking about when cases are purely spatial, for instance. So cases that talk about spatial uh, relations, which are not really core arguments at all, um, and that's another way of looking at it. So it's a bit different from saying that something's lexically determined. But the point I'm going to make today is that... Um, Case marking, the case marking potential of an argument is not always invariably governed. So this means that we don't always get consistent case marking. Okay. So even if we've got something that, uh, that uh, we've got, often got cases that fall into these different types, but we can also have things which might be called uh, probabilistically determinable case. Okay, um, so this happens when case marking is based on variable characteristics of the governor and the governee. Okay, the governor is the thing that says you go in this case, and the governee is the thing that has that case. So the governee is the noun phrase, um, and the and the governor is a preposition or a verb. Okay. Um, Okay, um, so when we have this, there's a less straightforward relationship between the, um, between the normal mapping that we have, which is where you have the argument structural case frame of a verb and its dependent NPs talking to one another in a fairly straightforward way. Okay, so on then to differential argument marking. Um, 
Now, when we have variability in the types of case marking that we can have on a noun phrase, this can give rise to differential subject marking and differential object marking. Okay, these are terms, particularly differential object marking, that you're probably familiar with already. Differential subject marking is just the same thing, but it's on subjects. Okay, this can be done in a number of different ways. I'm only going to be talking about differential case marking today because there are no, there's no agreement in these languages. But it could also be done through indexing on the verb um, or other types of verbal morphology. Okay, so here are a couple of examples from Manangurung. It's called Manangurung because Gurung is an enormous language, and we're, I'm only talking about the languages spoken in Manang district today, which is the district of Nepal. So we're talking about variety of Gurung here. Um, here is an instance where we've got um, differential subject marking based on a tense split. Okay, so in 1A, we've got a past tense um, sentence, um, yesterday I dug a hole in the ground. And here you can see that the ergative marked pronoun, ngai, okay, is possible, but it's not possible here without the ergative. Okay? Uh, this is what you might think would be normal in a, in a fairly straightforward transitive type sentence, okay? or complement-taking type sentence, let's call it. Um, we can see if we look at ground, Okay, which here is the, the goal or the, the whatever you want to call that argument, the third argument. Um, here it's got locative case, okay, but you can't leave off the locative case, right? Now, if you look at the second example, here we've got an example in the non-past, okay, uh, so present or future. So here the reading is, tomorrow I will dig a hole in the ground. The ground behaves in the same way. You have to have locative case on that. Um, whether, you, whether you consider that an argument or an adjunct doesn't matter for our current purposes. But what you can see on the subject is that either the ergative can be there or not. Okay. So this, this uh, the ability for ergative to be there or not is the kind of thing I'm interested in. Okay. This split is only within the non-past. So we've got a tense, uh, we've got an aspect, sorry, a tense split, and then within the non-past, we then have differential ergative case marking. Okay. So the object of, of the research is to find out what's going on when we have this. Under, under what conditions do you have one and not the other? Okay, so you're now familiar with differential argument marking, differential object marking, differential subject marking. Let's throw in another differential. It's differential ergative case marking. Okay, so this is a type of differential argument marking. It's just when, it's, when we're just talking about the ergative case, whether the ergative case is there or not. Okay, now it's often referred to as optional ergative case marking. For good reasons, this is a terrible term. Anything that is optional is a dreadful, dreadful term in linguistics because it's not optional. It just hides the fact that we don't know what it does, okay, why, it's, why it's behaving in this way. So the project that I've got at the moment is on optional ergative case marking, but I'm going to refer to it as differential ergative case marking from now on. Okay. Um, <clears throat> okay, so when we've got differential ergative case marking, what we find is the presence or absence of case marking, but that this is optionally absent in inverted commas because it doesn't have any consequences for the grammatical function of the MP. And by that, I mean that the MP is still the subject. Okay, it's not changing into an object or any other type of oblique uh, role. It's still the subject. Okay, now what I don't include here is anything to do with information structure. So that's not what I mean by grammatical function. Grammatical function here means what its what its role is, whether it's subject or object, or whether it's some other type of argument. Okay, or adjunct. Um, now, um, differential ergative case marking has a fairly restricted distribution, um, but it's commonly found in certain areas. Okay, so it is found in little patches all over the place, but um, the main areas where we find it are in the Himalayas and in Australia in Papua New Guinea. Okay, so I'm obviously going to be talking about the Himalayas uh, today if you hadn't already gathered that from the picture and the references I've made so far. There are lots of different factors that are involved in differential ergative case marking, and some of these uh, include information structure, uh, position on the animacy hierarchy of the argument in question, and whether there are any tense aspect mood splits in the language. Now, why was I talking about referential density? Well, the main reason is because these languages have extremely low referential density. 
What this means is that the preference for argument realization is such that you very rarely, or much less so than, say, a language like English, have over noun phrases, whether, na whether headed by a, a common noun or a pronoun or whatever. They just don't turn up as much as you might expect them to. Okay. Now, um, this is a bit of a problem when you want to look at case marking, because case marking tends not to turn up unless it's on a noun or a pronoun. Okay, so um, the reason why I'm talking about referential density here is because we've got three languages with very low referential densities, so we don't see noun phrases as much as we might expect. Therefore, we're going to expect the case marking to turn up much less than we would hope to. Okay, so what we're going to examine today, or what I'm going to try and show you that I'm attempting to examine because it's quite difficult given the data set, is the conditions under which AS arguments can be differentially marked or omitted in these languages. And the, the important point is that here is that they've got low referential density. So we have to explore which factors influence the manifestation of AS arguments at all as well as whether they get mark case marked or not too. Okay, so there's two things here. When do the arguments turn up? When they do turn up, when do they get ergative case marking? Okay, so when do they turn up is the referential density. Do, when do they get case marking is the differential argument marking. Okay, so um, these are the languages that I'm going to talk about today. This is part of uh, two projects. One of the projects is um, a project funded by the British Academy, which is uh, a project on optional ergative case marking. Um, that's a two-year project, and we're going to be at the end of the first year in May. So some of th this stuff is, is really rather preliminary, I should say. The other project is a five-year project. That's a project run by Christine Hildebrandt at SIUE. That's a, and some of you may have seen a talk given by us at um, LDLT4 earlier, well, last a uh, couple of months ago. Um, that project is on mapping sociolinguistic variables to geo, um, like Google Maps style maps of the Himalayas. So satellite imagery, there's text linked in to this sociolinguistic information. Um, and we're collecting lots, as part of both of the products, we're, we're projects, we're collecting discourses, and um, in, as well as sociolinguistic interviews and some elicitation too. And other elicitation takes place in Kathmandu. So this is going to report on a subset of the results from that work, um, and it's also on a subset of the languages, because we're working on four different languages. Um, those languages are Manange, Manangurung, and Na. Um, and the fourth language, these are all Tamangic languages, so the Tamangic languages I'll speak about today. The fourth language is called Gyalsundo. This is a Tibetic, um, Tibetan sorry, language, um, which until recently was thought to be part of the Tamangic group, but Christine and Joe Perry have demonstrated that that's not the case. So um, it's, it's Tibetan, and it's really quite different from these languages, and I'm not including it just in the interest of time more than any other reason. Okay. So you can see here, even though this is a wonderful project with wonderful maps, I've gone old school and given you a very basic map here uh, because it involved much less effort. Um, this, is, uh, this is Nepal here. So just above this black region is Tibet. We're about 15 kilometers from the border with Tibet. Uh, not that you could get there very easily, of course. Um, the blue area is where Manange is spoken. The green area is where Manangurung is spoken. The orange area is where Nar is spoken. And Gyalsumdo is kind of intermingled with Manangurum in the green area. Okay, so the, in, in many of the um, uh, Gyalsumdo villages there are also Gurung speakers and, and vice versa. Okay. Um, Nar village is very, very high up and very, very isolated and it took us um, 11 hours of walking to get to the place where we were going to stay the night to then walk another six or seven hours the next day to get to the village. So it's very, very remote. And I was very ill when I was doing it too. Okay, so let's get on to some data then, <clears throat> and you can see what kind of concerns I've got about dealing with these issues. Here is some um, data on differential ergative marking in Manangurung, and there are two sets of examples here. In the first set, we've actually got some um, intransitives. Okay, and um, the reason why I'm showing you intransitives is because if, you, if I showed you a transitive, it would be very boring. It's going to have, if it's past tense, it's going to have an ergative marker on it in an elicited utterance. Okay, so there's no point in showing it to you, it's boring. This is more interesting because I'm just showing you that the split is not quite along the lines of 
transitive intransitive or complement taking not complement taking what we've really got here are some um, splits which are determined by other properties in this case a property of the noun phrase and of the verb okay so this is not every intransitive verb that will do this just a subset they're kind of unergative un type verbs uh, we haven't quite got it right what we think they are yet or how we might classify them but um, here we've got jump and with an animate uh, human animate, we have to have the ergative case marker on uh, the boy jumped. Okay, But if it's a goat that's jumping, the ergative marker is not possible. So there's a distinction here, not just in that animates have to have it, but rather humans have it, and other high animates don't. Okay. In Gyalsumdo, we see other types of splits um, that don't quite mirror this. So a kangaroo behaves like a human, um, but sheeps, sheep and fleas behave differently. Okay, so we have all sorts of weird splits going on. Okay, um, the third th example here is kind of like the one that I showed you earlier. It's just the case of the split between past and non-past. So in the non-past, we've got this situation where we can have both ergative marking and not ergative marking or unmarked um, subject MP. And what again, what this shows is that we don't, we're not sure what the parameter is here. And the problem with elicitation of materials like this is that ergative case marking shows up in past tense clauses, you know, fairly regularly in, in elicitation, but it doesn't in discourses. Okay. So there's no point in spending a lot of time trying to work out what's going on in this elicited sentence, because what we really need to know is how it's being used in discourse, because that's going to be much more informative about the distribution of ergative case marking. Okay, so how are we going about doing this? Well, I've just said let's not bother with elicitation too much, although we are doing elicitation too. Um, what we're doing is um, we've collected lots of texts. They've been transcribed with native speaker help. Um, so our postdoc, Dubi, is doing that with native speakers and another um, Nepali transcription assistant. Um, and the discourse data is then entered, unfortunately by me, because it's very tiresome, into this database. And this is a very horrible screenshot of what it looks like. But what, uh, it, what I'm basically showing you here um, is the fields that get entered for each verb. So each record is a verb in a discourse. So imagine you have a sentence that's got three verbs in it. They're each going to have a record. Okay. The records match up to the toolbox, to how they're set up in toolbox. Um, each verb is then given a number as how it occurs sequentially within its toolbox record. So the third one in record, the third one will be verb three in toolbox one. But in the second sentence, the third verb will also be three, if you see what I mean. Because it will be in re reference to, and it will be the third verb there. Okay. Um, so what we've got here in red, you can see information about the subject. This, has got, this is information about whether it's a common noun, a pronoun, a kinship term, etc. bless you. Um, whether it's person marked, number marked, case marked, definiteness marked, possessed, has uh, a demonstrative, whether it's quantified with a number or any other quantifier, whether it's attributively modified, or whether it's uh, modified with a clause. Okay, so just filling in one subject takes a while. And they're just the things that you can see. There's also a box of semantic -y things over here, which are not necessarily marked. And the reason for this is that you might say that something doesn't have number marking, but it may well be plural, because number marking doesn't always turn up either. Okay, so I'm trying to make this as, as, as broad as possible. Um, you, it, this is just a part of the, of the database. Um, for every argument, the same information is being encoded. It's also, other information that's being encoded includes um, what its argument potential is, so whether it can take a complement or not, how many verbs since the last mention of the subject, if it's co-referential with an earlier subject, whether the subject is anaphorically or cataphorically uh, available, lots and lots and lots of information. So filling in one verb takes some time. It's quite slow progress. The stuff in blue at the top is about aspect tense, nominalization marking, whether it's conver converbial um, form, etc. Okay, and the stuff in, at the top in the header is just about where, what text it's from, what language, when it was added, etc. Okay, so we're using data, as I said, from um, stories. So the stuff that's in the database at the moment is stories or na just narratives, kind of expositional texts. Um, but uh, it will ultimately include lots of different things, but not elicitation. Okay, it's all spontaneous um, or semi-spontaneous. And um, 
what we, what we claim then is that this permits the exploration of linguistic variability through exploring consistencies and subtle differences among the languages under investigation. So we're getting similar types of data from the languages. Um, it's not uh, as, as beautifully constrained as I would like it to be, but that's just to do with how much is in there at the moment, and you'll see what I mean by that in a minute. Okay, so what kind of variables are we interested in then? Well, here they are. These are all based on paper uh, discussion in um, Chelia and Hislop, who had a volume on uh, uh, differential argument marking in uh, the Tibeto-Burman area. And um, the ones in red are things that we can encode in the database. Okay, although speech predicates actually, that isn't strictly encoded, but you can tell whether something's a speech predicate or not. So at the moment, it doesn't seem to be that relevant to, to me. Um, so the predicate valence clause polarity, aspect tense, person, number, animacy, humanness, definiteness, specificity, referentiality, etc. Um, whether it's a heavy MP or not, so whether it's modified, that's what all that modification stuff is about. And that's also includes whether it proceeds or follows. Um, whether there's a switch in the agent or not, um, actually that isn't strictly encoded. Um, the stuff in green, so they're the things that we could encode and we aim to encode. Um, the stuff in green is stuff which is much harder to encode uh, because it involves, but these are also claimed to be important in um, differential ergative case marking. So whether the agent is volitional or not, whether they had control of the situation or not has been demonstrated to be the case in some languages. Um, uh, it's sometimes used to, for contrastive focus purposes. This is quite difficult because we don't know enough about the languages. It's not that it's difficult per se, but we just don't know enough about the focus situation yet. Um, subjective judgments of the speaker, so what their attitude is towards the event, and um, socially unexpected actions. And again, really difficult to encode in a database unless you've got cultural awareness. And even if you have got cultural awareness, it may also be very, very difficult to encode uh, if you're not the speaker. Okay. Um, and uh, I'm doing the stuff in the database, so there's just no way that's going to happen. Okay. Okay, so to give you an idea of what's in the database so far, here is a table showing what we've got for Menange, Gurung, and Na. It's a very small set of data, and this will come up again and again. It's got, it poses lots of limitations for what I can talk about today. Um, but as I say, we're, you know, this is a project in progress, not a final project. So you should just take these as being indicative of what we're trying to do rather than what our results are. Okay, so um, what this table shows then are the three languages. They're in the columns, uh, uh, Menange, Gurung, and Na. And the red row at the top says how many verb forms we have for each language. Um, there's also Gyalsundo data, which is about the same, proportionately about the same. They're roughly around 100. I don't know why the Gurung one is so low. We've got loads of Gurung text, but it hasn't, they just haven't been entered yet. Um, so uh, it's a small data set. The next column says um, how, so that means that there are, you know, almost 300 records, let's say, well, between 250 and 300 records. Um, for those three languages. Um, the, next col the next row says how many um, verbs there are with overt noun phrases, um, either as their intransitive subject or the subject of a transitive or, or ditransitive. Um, and you can see that out of those 129 verb forms, only 37 have subject, overt subjects. Now, of course, some of them are depend independent clauses, and they wouldn't have overt subjects in English either. Um, or they'll be, f but m most of them are not. So it's it's quite a low number, and of all of these, so with 129 verbs, we get three ergative marked noun phrases. So you can see for the Manang data, Manange data, it's really really low, and it's really really difficult. So to just get three, I had to do 129 records in the database. Now I could just pick and choose them, but the point is it doesn't make any sense unless you know what's going on in the preceding or, or uh, the records afterwards. Um, similarly, if you look across the table, you'll see that for each of them within this data set there are just three ergative case marked forms for each language. Okay, um, And uh, of the um, this is the important part here for our purposes, okay? These are the complement-taking verbs. By that, I mean things that take complements like objects or clauses or non-finite clauses, but not 
copulas that take predicative arguments, okay? They're not complement-taking in this definition. They're counted as intransitive. Um, so, there are th out of these 129, there are 35 transitive um, verbs uh, that could have an argument, potentially, and 11 of them do, and only three of them are ergative in Menange. We've got 33 in Gurung, um, seven, of, seven of those have an overt uh, argument, and um, three of them are uh, ergative. So this is a subset of this number. Okay? And uh, with NAR as well, 34, so we've got a similar data set for each language here, and we can see that they've got roughly the same distribution of, um, of uh, overt A's. Um, and roughly the same distribution, well, exactly the same distribution of ergatives, but, of course, they're percentages, so they're not quite identical. Okay. Um, now, if we double this uh, in terms of verbs, we should expect to have double the ergatives, right? So, to get 10 ergatives, it's going to be, you know, 300 verbs. It's quite a lot of text. It's quite a lot of work. Okay, but we'll get there at some point in the future. Okay, so as I said, this is work in progress, um, and so there are some data problems and there are some solutions that we can apply to it to see if we can get a bit further along. Okay, as I said, elicited data is unreliable for determining splits because the generalizations do not extend to discourse, so as soon as you look at discourse, you're none the wiser. Okay, now if you're just interested in what somebody's got in their grammatical system, um, you know, what they uh, think of in terms of their... Uh, what's grammatical and what's not grammatical, then, you know, you can do elicitation. But really, what we're interested in how language works, and I think this is a better way of doing it. Um, so the data set exhibits low referential density for all three languages, um, and this leads to a minimal capacity to case mark MPs. Um, so we just don't get enough MPs to look at. There's limited, uh, this limited text coding, so that's the amount of data that I've managed to code so far, um, but also the frequency within that, so the relative frequency, like three ergatives for 129 verbs, um, reduces the power of the statistical methods that can be used on this data. Okay, so with more data, you can use more powerful st statistical methods. Okay. But with this data, there are some methods that you can use. Um, what, basically what happens is the test is expecting to find a certain number within the cells of your tables. And if it doesn't find the certain number that it requires, it rejects, it rejects that data and the statistic doesn't work. Okay. So you have to be able to interpret when you can use the statistic and when you can't. But there is another test we can use. Okay. So what's the solution then? Well, um, what we're going to do is look at some of the variables contributing to the presence, absence of overt arguments to elucidate the conditions under which case marking of subjects is possible. Okay, so what I'm going to do first of all is try and eradicate a quite obvious but statistically significant parameter. Okay, continuity of reference. Okay. Now, in English, we're very used to having a subject. Okay, so uh, although I haven't looked at discourse data in English, of course, um, I'm going to claim that there are lots of times where you would need a subject in English, but you wouldn't in one of these languages. Okay. Um, now, what I looked at here, what we, well, I did it, but what we looked at was um, whether there was a relationship between continuity of reference from one verb to the next and... Um, whether there's an overt argument or not. Okay. It's a very, very simple uh, test. Okay. What we're looking for, or what we would predict, is that if there's a switch in reference, then a noun phrase will turn up. Right? Because we don't have them most of the time, but we'd expect to find it. Okay. Now, it's a very, it's a very simple thing, and very boring in many respects, but it's something that we can do with this data. And what it does is it, it, t it tells us when we've got our noun phrases. And the data's quite striking, even on this small set. So, remember, um, what we've got here are 129 verbs for Menange, 86 for Nar, and 71 for Gurung. And what I did was use the Pearson's chi-square test to examine whether the discontinuation of subject reference, so that's the same ref, different ref, is a predictor of the realisation of an A or an S 
with an NP. Okay, so I'm not just looking at transitive clauses here, it's transitive and intransitive, or complement taking and not complement taking. And what you can see, uh, this is a null hypothesis in grey. Uh, the null hypothesis is not upheld. We do have statistically significant results. So the null hypothesis states there's no relationship between these two factors, these two variables. But actually there is. There's a significant relationship, association between continuity of reference and avoidance of overt ASs um, in all three languages. So basically, if you look at the data uh, at the top in the table, these are called contingency tables. Um, what they tell us is how many, what the, freak, what the frequency of each, uh, what the frequency count is of each of these within the corpus. So of the 129, there were three examples where the reference continued to be the same, but there, were, there was an overt noun phrase. So that's the thing that we weren't expecting to happen. But it does happen a bit, of course. And this is good data then, because we don't expect it all to be neat, right? If your data's too neat, it means that it might be wrong. Okay, you want to have things that are a little bit like this. That's why we use the statistic. Okay, so um, what this shows then is if you've got an overt uh, A or S noun phrase, that's a column on the left, then the, it's very likely you're going to have the set, a different referent. So three of the times it was the same referent, but 36 of the times it was different. Okay, so that's what this statistic tells us. And this is just reporting that it's significant. This means chi-square. This is the... Um, degrees of freedom, and this here is the important part, the bit with the P. It needs to be less than uh, 0 0.05 to be significant, and all of these are less than 0 0.05. Okay. Okay, so that is one thing I managed to do on this data. I'm very pleased with myself. You know, there's, it's a very limited data set, so, you know, to do something like that's pretty good. Now, um, so let's look at some data. How am I doing for time, actually? I could probably talk for hours. It's 20 minutes. 20 minutes? Oh, that's okay. Right, so now we're going to look at some data from the individual languages. Now I've talked you through what we're interested in. Um, this, is one of the this is one of the villages. It's called Tulo Manang, which means Big Manang, um, and it's um, situated in a wide part of the valley, it's extremely beautiful, um, and um, these are the terraces where they grow their vegetables, basically. Um, and um, this is the capital of Manang district, okay, uh, where they speak Manangue. Okay. So remember, we've got three examples with ergative case marking. That isn't enough data to say anything meaningful about. What we're looking at, the, data, the complete data set is transitives, or complement taking verbs rather, where there is an overt argument. That's the data set, not just the ergatives. We're looking at when it's there and when it's not there. Okay, so um, here's the, the data of, well, here's the discussion of the data. The data is on the next page, so you can look at it on your slides if you want to at the same time, on your handout. Um, in uh, Menange discourse, what we find is that ergative is marked by an enclitic, and this follows the plural number clitic if it's there, and the definiteness clitic, so it's at the end of the noun phrase where we'd expect it to be. Um, and ergative marking is used in discourse to denote a switch between equally agentive participants, protagonists. Okay, So it's used when there could be some doubt over who is doing what. It's, it's saying that there's a switch, who you were talking about before is no longer being talked about. Um, within these clauses, um, all objects or complements are overtly realised. We'll see why this is relevant later on. Um, and um, it's in well, they're in the kind of clauses that you might expect them to be. Main clauses, evidentially marked for these sorts of languages, or tense marked. Uh, well, these are evidentially marked. I mean, they've got different, you know, some of them are tense marking languages, some of them are evidential marking languages, some of them have a bit of a combination. Um, so it's in a main clause or a converbial transitive clause where there's a different subject to the matrix. Okay, so it's important that that... Uh, shows up. Okay, so here's some data. These are not sentences in sequence, although they are from the same story. They're just nice examples. Um, so um, here we've got after the yak, after the yaks who stayed on the hill cursed them. Uh, literally him, because there's like the plural marking is kind of up the wall in these languages. Um, so um, in red, in four, is the ergative subject of curse, okay, so it's S-O-V here, so the pronoun that follows that is the object, um, and um, uh, what you might glean is the yaks who stayed on the hill cursed them, what we've got here is a switch from, we were talking about them before, that's the yaks which are at the bottom of the hill, in the valley, 
So there's two sets of yaks, right? So this is how we know they're equally, equally protagonistic and they're equally, uh, they're, they have the same properties. There's just some up a mountain and some down a mountain. And I don't think anybody's ever claimed that up and down a mountain is a variable for optional active case marking. Okay, um, the second example there, it's got the same um, issue. Saying become like this, they made a curse. Um, we've got here a switch. Um, from the previous clause, which you can't see here because it's, it's not, four is not the clause before five. Um, and similarly in six, the friends were saying, are they coming back or not? After that, they didn't come back. You can see in these examples that they're talking about different participants and it's the ergative case marking there is not because they're agentive. It's not because they're, um, well, it is because they're agentive, but it's not just because they're an animate or plural. There are cases where they're animate and plural and it doesn't get ergative marking elsewhere. It's because we're switching between two equal sets. And what's interesting about the Menange discourse is that when there's an overt noun phrase, but it's not ergative case marked, although they're very infrequent, these are the three examples which didn't fit my statistic nicely. Well, I said they were okay, but some people looked like they didn't like it too much. Um, so the, uh, these are the three aberrant examples. They appear when um, it's used for maintenance of reference here. So we've got the erg showing up when we're switching, but if we need to maintain for some reason, we've got a noun phrase. Okay, so these are this the 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 presence of the noun phrase is determined by what's going on in terms of the structure of the discourse, but so is the ergative case marking. W what I should point out though is that ergative case marking couldn't turn up on any argument in that. Uh, scenario, it's, it's got to be because it has certain properties like animates. The ergatives turn up, they're always animate when they turn up in the data set we've got. Okay. Um, they're also all definite and specific for these unmarked ones. The objects are realised, but these, have, these are also main clauses, but they actually have a different characteristic in terms of their um, TAM marking, and we don't know what this N is at the moment, but it, these show up when N is there. So that's suspicious. Uh, but it's interesting. Okay, so um, distinguishing between the roles of arguments within the clause is not well motivated by this data. Um, so the reason why I claim this is because the object, objects show up in the ones which are unmarked and the ones which are marked for ergative case. So anybody who ever claims that ergative case marking c turns up to differentiate between an object and, an, and a subject, they're kind of missing the trick because when you look at lots of data, that isn't what they're doing at all. Okay, so um, it doesn't, it's not well motivated for that reason. Rather, it supports the view that erg will be marked on A's when there's a greater likelihood of distinguishing reference across clauses. Okay. Okay, the next language we're going to look at is Manang Gurung. So this is Gurung, it's got like million, I think it's got like, I don't know how many, do you know how many speakers it's got, Tom? Gurung? Half a million or so. Half a million, it's massive. And it's spoken over a really wide area. But this is just Manang Gurung, which has like, maybe a thousand or so speakers. Okay, so this is uh, some children at a school in Nache village. Okay, now it's not, this erg case marking isn't just showing up in the data set when there's a switch between participants, there's also lexical case in these languages. Okay, so although I'm talking about differential argument marking in general, some of this stuff is not differential. It has to be there. Okay, so in Manangurung, you have to have ergative case marking with a verb like no. It's lexically specified. So I'm not claiming that all ergative case marking belongs to one type, rather that in some of the data it looks as though lexical um, considerations are, are afoot. So here are some elicited examples, but I'll come on to discourse examples in a minute, of uh, the verb no. This is the verb to mean know someone or something rather than knowing a place. Okay, and what we have here are two non-past um, sentences and the ergative case mark is a question and answer pair. Ergative case marking is required on second person singular subject in the question and the first singular subject in the answer. Um, it's not possible to have it without ergative case marking and the, the object or the complement needs to be in the dative case. Okay. It can't be unmarked. Okay. Um, now, this only makes sense when we compare it when, with another verb, like uh, know a place. So here you can see um, the relationship between the, uh, the semantic roles and their case marking. Um, to know someone something has an experiencer in the nominative 
Oh, sorry, it shouldn't say nominative, it should say ergative there. Ergative and a stimulus and a dative, whereas the knowing a place has the experiencer and the dative and the stimulus is unmarked. And I've put abs in there because that's the unmarked case in these languages, but um, it, there's no overt marking for it. Okay, so here we've got those examples. It's not possible to have it without it. And what would have been nicer here was to show that you can't have it with the ergative as well. But I'm afraid I do not have that data uh, on these slides. It's probably in the, hand in the notes somewhere. Okay, so um, these verbs say, I need my subject in a certain case. Okay, it's not differential argument marking. It has to be that way. Okay. So what we're going to expect is if we've got an overt MP for one of these verbs as a subject, it's going to have ergative case marking on it in the discourses. Okay. And that is actually what we find, I'll show you in a second. So certain verbs have invariable lexically determined case resulting in the presence of a case on an overt A, even when it might otherwise be probabilistically predicted based on other characteristics of the discourse. Okay. That's how you know that it absolutely must be lexically specified. If it doesn't meet your characteristics, your probabilistic characteristics, then it's absolutely and it's kind of an outlier and you have to be able to uh, work, explain why it doesn't behave in that way. Okay, so when we look at the, di the discourse, we do see this pattern. Um, so um, in the Manangurung discourse, um, erg is marked by an enclitic on pronouns in the data set, so it's only on pronouns uh, in, the in the discourse data that we've got. Um, uh, two of the three verbs that have ergative subjects are the verb to know someone something. Okay, um, and as I said, it lexically governs case on its subjects. I put pronominal subjects in here in brackets, but I was just being cautious when I did that. I, I, it should be all subjects. Um, re referential density is so low that there are only two unmarked transitive subjects, and these are subjects of nominalized verbs. Um, and so th there's not really much to say about those, and I, I can't really make any generalizations. But here's the data. Um, this is an example from the, from the discourse, and here's an enlisted example just to demonstrate again that it doesn't, uh, it's not possible to leave the ergative case marking off this verb, off this subject. Okay, then on to Nar village. Uh, Nar village is very high up, so we're, you know, we're really, this is mountain region now, okay, and it's again very, very beautiful. That's the village at the beginning of the, on the fr front page of the slides. Okay. Date, the data from NAR is very well behaved and really uh, nice to look at and um, re it was really, really easy to analyse um, and that's lovely. Um, uh, what we have here are two sentences from a discourse. Again, the ergative subject is in red um, and what we've got here is when we've got the um, ergative noun phrases what, we'll, what you can see is, in each case, we've got, a de, a, in the English translation at least, we've got a dependent clause and then the main clause. Um, having returned to the village, the village is sent me packing again. Okay. The person returning to the village is the speaker of the story. Okay. Um, he is the topic of the discourse in general. Okay. And what we find here is that we're getting the ergative mark noun phrase when we're switching from the general topic to some other type of temporary topic. <coughs> okay. So um, in both cases, it's very clear from this data that that's what's going on. Um, so erg is marked by an enclitic. Again, it follows the plural number marker. Uh, it marks non-discourse topic. So discourse topic, I mean to be the general topic of the discourse. So you can switch you know, during it. Of transitives and ditransitives. Um, all objects are unrealized in clauses with erg subjects. And all clauses are affirmative, past tense, or main clauses. Um, the main clauses. Um, and in two cases, we, we, I really like these examples. The transitive verb is the V1 in a serial verb construction with an intransitive V2. So what we end up with is that the subject, um, the, uh, the S of the V2, the intransitive verb, is the same as the P of the transitive, right? So we've got the P of the transitive and the S being co-referential. Um, I wonder if that was an example there in 11. Um, Okay, so remove, come home. Okay, the villagers removed me, I came home. Right, so it's quite a nice example. 
of how this, pa this is patterning in terms of uh, complex verb structures. Okay, what about the unmarked ones? Well, all subject MPs without case marking and complement taking clauses are pronouns or kinship terms used as topics. Um, all objects are realised in, um, in those clauses. And the verb form is usually non-finite um, in contrast to the cases where the ergative is there when it's usually a finite clause. So there's um, um, a finite main clause. Okay, so in the NAR data... Um, what's interesting is there's an asymmetry between the presence of objects in clauses with unmarked transitive agents and ergative marked transitive agents. And um, now this may just be a, a, fa a fact about the data set, so I don't want to get too excited about it, but it, it is interesting because it makes the languages look very different from one another. And I suspect even, I suspect they really are quite different from one another in terms of the way that their discourse is structured. We actually see that there are Ma there are many more, um, I, I can show you in the table um, in the question period if you like, there are, there's a, a, a massive difference in terms of how many transitive and intransitive clauses there are in each of the languages, which may, ha may be affecting the, the, what's going on. Um, okay, so what I did then, just to see whether it was interesting or not, is to look at whether there was a relationship between having a complement um, and having ergative case marking. Okay, so this is using Fisher's exact test. This is what you do if the chi-square isn't going to work, okay, because your data set's too small. Um, so we examined whether the presence of a complement um, in a clause with a complement-taking verb. So this is a verb that can have a complement, but it might not have one there overtly. Okay, it might be that you get it from the discourse, that it's, you know, you can retrieve it from the discourse, just as we know that they have subjects, but they're retrievable from the discourse. Um, uh, and an overt subject... Um, and we wanted to see whether that's a predictor of uh, case marking. So the null hypothesis is that there's no relationship between the presence and absence of a complement and the presence and absence of ergative case marking. But what we found is that there is a significant association between the presence of ergative case and the presence of a complement in Menange, but uh, an association between the presence of ergative case and the, and the absence in Na. Okay? And Gurung was not significant. So the Menange data and the NAR data is the only data that's significant here. And what's going to be really interesting moving forward to be, will be to see whether this still holds when we've got enough data in the database to move on to a chi-square test and see whether that really is a, a pattern that's representing something about the structure of the discourse. Okay, so, right, what I've um, spoken about today is a work in progress and what I've tried to show you are some attempts to deal with very small data sets. Okay. In an ideal world, how you make this better is you get someone to put loads and loads and loads of data into the database. Right? It's set up, it's ready to go, the distinctions have been made, it's the manpower that's required. Okay. When I present this to you in two years' time, it will be wonderful. Okay. But what I've done in the meantime is start to think about what problems I'm interested in and how to start to solve them and what kind of power I need in my data to be able to solve those problems. Okay. So, um, the major problem, I think, is the low incidence of MPs because this means we're not going to get enough case-marked MPs. Um, so, despite the low incidence of subject MPs, so the low referential density, um, and of ergative-marked MPs, it too, um, the presence of case-marking is not strictly determined by the grammatical function of an MP, because these really are the subjects, um, but also its information structural properties, or discourse structural properties, maybe if you don't feel comfortable with information structural properties there. Um, switches in reference were shown to have statistically significant relationship with the occurrence of overt MPs. Okay, so that's how we can factor out that issue. Uh, in, in Menange, the presence of unmarked AMPs was associated with continuity of reference, while ergmarked MPs denoted a switch. Okay, so we saw a distribution in that data. A significant relationship was shown between the presence of erg and the absence of a comp in NAR. And this demonstrates, this is uh, something I mentioned earlier, but the statistic demonstrates that this is statistically significant, it, that it's not associated with distinguishing two arguments of a verb. Okay, that's not why erg is showing up, because in NAR, they don't occur together. So it's got nothing to do with that. Um, the incidence of erg marked MPs is too low in the data set to determine relationships between other factors such as person marking definiteness and number, but one thing we can say is that all of the erg marked MPs are animate, but we might have really have expected that because inanimates don't tend to do much. <laughs> um, and uh, 
determining the distribution of ergative case marking, I argue, can only be understood by understanding what can be expressed by its absence too. Thank you very much. Loads of room for thought. I have two questions which I'll try to keep very brief. The first one pertains to slide 12, where you have that nice table. Um, I think, was it that one? This one? Or do you want the big one? Um, the big one, actually, no. not the slide 12, but yeah, this one. Yeah. Um, where you make the prediction that if you would double your yeah. verbs, yeah. you would also double the instances of ergative marking. And I'd like to challenge that a bit, Yeah. but I think you can actually turn it to your advantage because uh, what you have shown is that the presence of ergative marking is linked to the type of participant of the verb, mm -hmm. so animacy, uh, for instance, and position on the animacy scale. And of course, we know that certain verbs lexically subcategorize for human or animate participants. And in a small discourse sample, it really will crucially depend on the protagonists. Yeah of the story. So, you know, one story with one human protagonist can totally skew your entire data set. Mm -hmm. But for your case, since you are interested in not just the absence, but explicitly the presence as well, you can actually use that by selecting genres and particular mm -hmm. topics, for instance. Yeah. You can even use visual stimuli that yield certain descriptive uh, linguistic descriptions yeah. that will have a high incidence of human, animate, and other participants yeah. in different positions of the animation. Absolutely. I should say that the the choice of text that's in the data set at the moment was entirely determined by the order in which they were ready, yeah. uh, and that we could make confident um, yeah. uh, uh, claims about what the argument structure is, whether it could take a complement or not, what the case possibilities were. Um, and that in itself was dictated by which of them were less complicated to start with yeah. by oh, the transcribers. But ab ab absolutely, yeah. I mean, as, as the data set grows, we'll start to be able to stratify it for genre and participants and all sorts of yeah. things to make even stronger claims. Um, but that's a long way off, but I totally yeah. agree with you. Yeah. So, yes. Uh, it's true. We might, so we shouldn't t read too much into this no, distribution at the moment. To differentiate between verb types and tokens. Mm -hmm. So you know, different lexical types, as in lexemes, and different instances of a particular lexeme. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah, that's a good idea. And then to my second question, which is related to a slide. Um, oops, I thought I had it down. Twelve? No, eighteen. Sorry. Um, there you talk about verbs where you say they have a difference in thematic roles. Yeah. And I'm not quite sure that I would like to agree with your analysis of the thematic roles. Because for me, thematic roles are generalizations about certain, uh, certain okay. types of thematic yeah. participants. And what you uh, mentioned here looks more to me like difference in, in semantic frames. So frame semantic participants, so not at the semantic level, mm -hmm. but at the conceptual level. Okay, so, so that if, you because if something is, uh, you know, marked differently, you can't have an experience in the nominative and the data. For me, that would be an index that these are actually different semantic participants, and that in the nominative uh, case, the what you call the experiencer is actually construed as mm -hmm. an agent. Whereas in the dative case, it is construed as an experience. Okay, so yeah, I mean, no, that's yeah, no, I think that's a totally fair criticism. Mm -hmm. And I think that that, um, that could be an alternative way of, 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 of certainly of talking about it. Um, I, the, the reason why I chose those semantic roles is because I was really taking um, from Bickle's referential density paper, um, he had sets of pairs rather like this, where he was claiming that they had exactly the same um, uh, semantic roles, mm -hmm. but different case marking associated with them. So they were pairs like um, to be afraid. Mm -hmm. So one was like a paraphrastic, paraphrastic version of the other, but they had different, um, they had the same semantic roles, but different case frames. And um, 
I rather uh, calced it, if you like, uh, directly into the talk. Um, yeah, so I don't have a strong feeling. Okay. For me, it's, it doesn't matter actually okay. whether they do have different uh, semantic roles or not, yeah. um, because it demonstrates more or less the same thing for me, that things which may look like they're the same might behave differently. It's lexically specified, though, that's for sure, yeah. Um, yeah, absolutely. because not all things that have experiences would definitely need to have an ergative subject, mm -hmm. and that's the that's what makes it different. Yeah. Thanks. Tom. Hi, I have a question about uh, the slide which is called continuity of reference. I think it was number nine. Uh, this one? Um, yes, yeah, that one. Um, I noticed that all three of the languages also had um, quite a lot of MPs which had neither an overt AS um, or the same reference, so it's minus and minus on that chart. So it's yeah. So it's and and there's 29 now, etc. And that's quite a lot. I was just wondering if you could say something about those those types of arguments. Yes. Uh, I okay. Yes. All right. Now, uh, that's an excellent question. Um, my suspicion is that. The, if you look at the um, Menangay table, it's very different from the others. And that's because it has a very high proportion of intransitive verbs in the data set. And I think it's to do with intransitives. So I think there's something about intransitives which mean that they're getting um, their... Uh, not the same referent as the previous verb, but they're not getting an overt noun phrase. I don't think it's within the transitive, so I could test that within the, within the subset. Um, I didn't because I was so pleased with myself for having a chi-square statistic that actually worked. Uh, I, this isn't the only one I attempted to do, I should point out. Um, the, uh, but I think that's what it is. Um, and I... I'm not sure what the rest of the story is, mm -hmm. though. But Speakers but tend to kind of infer who the, um, the, the essay argument is just from the context, even if they're switching, um, switching reference all the time. Yeah. Uh, I think it, yeah, I mean, so hopefully, you know, one way of maybe coding that would be to look at things which are reference, which are visual in context, like in the context of the discourse, for instance. Um, so speakers, uh, you know, participants who are present, objects which are present. Um, so that that's a good, really good um, suggestion, actually. I'll, I might have a look and see if I can work out what's going on. Yeah. Um, you first, and then Alex after. Yeah, just to connect to that, when I get things like that, to that text, maybe things like I dropped the pot and it broke, mm -hmm. and then you get a switch of subjects, so to say. But you know it was breaking, and it will be the pot. And you don't have to mention it. Again. Yeah. You know? Well, that accounts for the that accounts for the plus same referent minus examples, but it's the, it's the, the number with the 56 that's the problem, where you've got the same, you've got the different referent, but you've got no overt noun phrase. Oh, I broke, I dropped the pot and it broke. Yeah, yeah sorry, I see what you mean. Yeah, that's, uh, okay, yeah, sorry about that. Yes, uh, th that's also worth looking into. One thing that the database doesn't code at the moment is continuity from object reference to subject reference, and I think that that's the important part that's missing, and that should pick up on your suggestion, so I'll, I'll look into putting that in. Because in, in my perception, if I have similar data in Tibetan narratives, then uh, I get a, uh, a lower proportion of the verbs, but if it happens, it would be something like that. Yeah. Of, you know, yeah, that's highly likely, actually, because you'll never, ever get a third-person inanimate pronoun for something like that. It mm -hmm. just wouldn't happen. Yeah. The other thing I was wondering about, and it needs to her remark as well, is that... Uh, because this looks sort of familiar to me because I do Tibetan and mm -hmm. I sort of almost guess some <laughs> examples of what they mean. <laughs> yeah. you know? um, is that it's definitely abnormal to have an inanimate agent at all. Right? Yeah. It just doesn't happen except yeah. with very few exceptions. So that yeah. sort of changes the game. Okay? Yeah, I mean, that. That's why I only mentioned the animacy in passing, because it's just not really a very exciting mm. variable. Um, it's 
Much more interesting, interesting is where there's a split within what we would consider to be animates. Mm. So the flea not being able to be ergative marked, but a kangaroo being able to be ergative marked that I mentioned earlier. Um, but those sorts of things are just so going to be so rare in terms of these discourses that it's actually not worth worrying too much about it at this stage. You know, in a big corpus that would come out and it will come out in a licitation. But yeah, you're right. I mean, the animacy parameter is not as important as some of the other ones are. So I think humanness is more important. But I've got too many um, like yaks and stuff <laughs> at the moment. So the yaks are doing too much stuff. But when the humans are doing, the humans tend not to turn up. That's the thing because they're usually discourse participants. <laughs> Yeah, Alex. How do you find transitively intended verbs in a language that regularly drops <laughs> vectors not exp uh, expressed in participants? <laughs> yeah, okay. Right. Um, okay, so complements, complements are often there. Okay, so object complements and other and clausal complements are often there. Okay, so being able to take what being able to take a clausal complement is what I've taken as the benchmark for saying whether something is complement taking or not. Okay, um, and something that is labile, a verb that really is genuinely labile, and when the uh, when it's not there, it's necessarily intransitive, um, or could be necessarily intransitive. Um, those verbs are they're, they're more obvious, so it's more it's easier to work out when to code them. Um, but the 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 basis um, the basis of it is is the first stop the first stage is can this verb ever take a complement? Okay. Then we know that it has the potential for taking a complement. Then looking at the text and seeing whether it's dropped its complement or not. There's no syntactic test that, to be able, that we can that we have the capacity to do on that at the moment. But it's um, that's 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 the basis of the decision making in those terms. Um, you know, the the only other way you could do it is by saying, well, this is what I'm going to list this verb as in my dictionary. Okay, this is its potential, intransitive, labile, transitive, whatever. But really what's important for me is whether it could have a complement and doesn't. And that's the that's I need to have it as a binary thing. So yeah, it's kind it's a little bit flaky. Um, <laughs> But I think those sorts of judgments usually are quite flaky. I mean, if you want to decide whether eat is transitive or not, you know, we could speak for an hour about that. So, um, you know, it's one of those perennial problems, unfortunately. So what, are, what about um, object participants? Do they get dropped as much as uh, subject participants? Um, um, no. So, yeah, so the, none of my tables will show you um, what they, whether the object is there or not. Um, but, uh, well, let's have a look. We can have a look at the database. If it will open. Oh, I don't think it wants to open while I'm in this funny view. Is it? Oh, yeah. Cool. Okay, um, so if we wanted to see whether, um, let me just escape from that and I'll, if I can. No, okay, right, so uh, let me do a search. Okay, so what I want to do is see whether something is complement taking or not and whether it has an object or not. Um, okay, actually that will, that will do it. <laughs> Okay, so um, okay, we just need to find the right row. Um, okay. Okay, so out of the three hundred, this is across four languages. Okay, just for. Just to, to give you an idea. Um, so this is 162 records out of the 385 are coded as having the capacity to take complements. Um, and uh, let's see. Okay, well, oh, flip. Okay. Oh. 
it looks like about a third of the time they're there. That was the impression I got from that. And there's some sp spuriously empty ones. Um, if there's empty data, it means it wasn't important in computing the statistics. So there's like it's it's partially full. Yeah. That's really interesting because you mean you have them in about thirty three percent of instances, yeah. which is ten times as often. Yeah. yeah. The ob I mean, the objects show up that's way that's more than the subjects. Yeah. That actually um, reminds me of Du Bois' preferred argument structure, mm -hmm. you know, just yeah. space for activity, so that you have absolute yeah. type of arguments more often expressed. That mm -hmm. would be very interesting to look at, wouldn't it? Yeah, I think that's definitely got to be the next yeah. step in dealing with the data because the object stuff is just uh, has has not been important so far, but I think it's it's going to be. Yeah, yeah. Thanks, Alex. Um, Ed. So you demonstrated the connection between the reference switching and ergativity um, in these um, languages. In one of the languages, yeah. Um, I'm wondering if, so that's, a, that's an association. I'm wondering whether that is ultimately the, the reason for the ergative, or if there are other factors that might unify various distinct reasons for ergative. <coughs> I'm thinking in particular of something that you didn't discuss, mm -hmm. which was Okay, it's very cruel of you to ask me a prosody question <laughs> first thing. Uh, 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 I would really need Christine here to be able to answer a question on prosody, so I'm not going to attempt to do that. Um, but uh, there's, uh, I really can't say anything about whether the prosody is an important factor in whether something is being marked as ergative or not. Um, there are times when it's clear that a noun phrase is has a there's a prosodic break between a noun phrase and what <coughs> follows it or what precedes it. Um, but I don't think our prosodic analysis of the languages is at any stage of discussing it in these terms. I mean, what you can't see in this data is that they're all, there's lexical tone in all of these languages and that isn't marked in the data at the moment because it's still being worked out. So to be able to work out what's going on with the prosody, I think we'd want to feel a bit more confident about what's going on with the lexical tone first. Um, so, I mean, what do you have in mind? What would, your, what would you anticipate? Um, I mean, I was just wondering if the switch of reference Oh, that a switch in reference? Yeah, okay. I mean, what I've... You'll notice that I didn't draw any attention to a statistic which shows that that's the case. I just said that that's all of the cases that I've seen are doing that, okay? That happens to be a fact about that the text that those instances are in. Whether that extends more broadly is unclear at the moment. Um, so what, um, what the reason why the statistics are nice to employ, and there's only a few in this talk, is because they'll tell you whether one factor alone is sufficient for determining a particular pattern or whether you need more than one factor. So as, we, as the data set grows and we can do a log, what's called a log linear analysis on this data, then we can combine multiple sets of data into a single test to see and then remove them one by one to see whether uh, there's a, a stronger prediction is made. Okay, so the idea that if you put in three variables and it predicts it perfectly, what if we only have two? Can we predict it perfectly that way? Because that's got that's a better way of doing it. If you only need two to predict your outcome, um, but that's I can't do that because the data won't pass chi square and it won't pass log linear until it passes chi square. So that's the restriction. But um, it could be, but I don't think the data set's big enough to think about that. But it's a good good idea anyway. Yeah. Tom, did you have another? Yeah, just going back to that um, point about whether subject or object um, arguments are kind of expressed or not, I think it's quite kind of aerially typical that um, mm, P arguments are frequently omitted if they're topical. And mm -hmm. as the SNA arguments will have a kind of greater tendency to be topical, mm -hmm. then it's likely that more of them will be omitted. Mm -hmm. and the ones that the cases where yeah. you have P as yeah. overtly expressed is 
likely when it's new information, and those can also be admitted if they're already topical in the discourse. Yeah. Sure. That's like oh, quite typical of. Yeah. It, yeah. I think with the objects, it will be important to encode whether they're first. Me I mean, there's no, there's no um, system for encoding first mentions in here at the moment. But that's the other thing that needs to go in um, to be able to start looking at that. Because the, the, without that, it, the, the other parameters are not going to. The other added parameters aren't going to make much sense. And I think that you're you're totally right. Uh, yeah. <laughs> there's no kind of first mention, or whether it's new or not, then there's no yeah. kind of way of gauging that. Yeah, I mean, the, uh, the um, yes, and that's why, yes, and there's, no, and there's no way you could plug that into the statistics. Oh, right. So at the moment, like, the, the, the first mention thing is, just, is impressionistic here. What's topic is impressionistic. I should point that out, right? It's not, it's not based on a... Um, it's not based on uh, a, a, a counting method or anything like that. There is, a, there is actually a method for tracking reference in the database, uh, but I don't think it's quite watertight enough to claim that that's, that's robust using a statistic yet. Yeah, the first mention stuff needs to be coded. Yeah, thank you. You know, I was wondering whether, whether you could put the findings in wider comparative or, or functional or historical contexts? Like One could, I expect. Yes, I <laughs> would think so. Um, because it seems to be not coming from, from the language area. So mm. it doesn't seem, I mean, you know, there, you know it's, it's case terminology. Yeah. But it doesn't look very much like case. Oh, so I see. Right, OK. So then the question yes. is, so, so you have the restriction on the tense aspect. You have you know, you know, you find it in pronouns. You find it lexicalized with certain verbs. Mm. So what sort of in what sort of marking system is that? In OK, space right. Space? OK, so the alternative to calling it case, you could imagine calling it something like topic marker for some languages, right? You could imagine calling it, uh, I'm not necessarily talking about the languages I've got here, but there are, there are different things that you could call it other than case. Uh, lots of people call, don't call it case in, or use a case term like erg. They use something like agent. Um, the thing is, it doesn't really... That, that's just another. That's a way. That's just another way of presenting the same information. Yes, it's um, not consistent with your findings either. No, I mean, in some of these languages, the form of the ergative is the same as another case form. Mm. Okay, which suggests that it really is genuine case. Okay, um, uh, so uh, in Yelsumdo, the um, the genitive and ergative have the same form, and that's a typologically well-known combination of case uh, case syncretisms. Um, so that looks like case, but that's the Tibetan language. These are the Tamangic ones. Um, the um, within a broader context. Um, it seems that the parameters that affect the occurrence of ergative case marking, or what I'm calling ergative case marking here, is consistent with what's going on in other languages, not just in the Himalayas, but also elsewhere. Um, what is difficult to tell is the directionality of it. Um, and, and there are two ways that you could look at it, that it's developing or disappearing. Um, and. I personally don't have an opinion on that, but I'm sure scholars, be, scholars who are more acquainted with the area would do. Um, but um, I'm, I'm sensing I'm not answering your question very well. Oh, what no, is it you're you... You're doing well, you're doing well. But I'm, <laughs> <laughs> but I'm also curious, presumably older studies have been based much more on elicitation and text, so yeah. this is quite new. Yeah, but I think this area in general is quite new, because I don't think that people have been really considering um, have been considering this from a distri distributional perspective before so yes. i mean the the stuff the stuff that exists on this topic is sort of you know it's like in the last 20 years it's not old stuff it's you know the um, I can't speak about really old grammars, but there's, there's sort of a flurry of interest in it. At ALT this year, nearly every other talk was on differential argument marking in some form or the other. Everybody's looking at it. Um, and I think that, that represents what, that people are starting to get interested in it, particularly differential subject marking, because you know, people have been interested in object marking for a while, but I think differential subject marking, now people are starting to claim things. I know for Tibeto-Burman, or I'm, I suspect, based on the Chelier and Hislop 
book, um, pe- vol- I think it was a journal actually volume, that no statistical accounts have been done of this in Tibeto Burman languages. Um, so it's that's really the direction that it needs to go. That's what I'm trying to sort of like get towards. I'm wading through mud at the moment, but get in that direction. Yeah, yeah. Um, Just one thing. I, I did something like that for switch reference in, in the classical Tibetan, mm-hmm. and um, our case model is fairly consistent on agents, so it looks like it's getting sort of worse all the time. Um, <laughs> at the same time that they develop tens aspect splits mm-hmm. within Tibet. Did you publish anything? Did you publish it? No. It will come, okay. <laughs> d- d- share it with me when you're ready, anyway. Yeah, I'd really like to have so. it. Hmm? Tibetan is a different language from these. Yeah, they, so, I mean, they, they, they do Gyal behave Sum, quite. Gyal Sumdo, yeah, but they, uh, Gyal Sumdo, I don't. I, outside of the Himalayas. Yeah, but these are yeah, yeah, but, yeah, no, 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 but in the in the in the in answering that question, he was talking about. I was talking about Tibeto Burman, like somebody doing statistical work on it. Um, yeah, Gyalsundo is not like this, though. I mean, Gyalsundo is very different. It's got um, it's got a conjunct disjunct agreement system. It's got um, loads more cases. Um, it's doesn't look like this. Doesn't behave like this. Um, so uh, that's one reason to exclude it for the time being. But it's very interesting. And that's got all sorts of differential argument marking. Um, object and subject. Okay. Did we exhaust you? More or less, yeah. Good stab. Yeah.